The Ecuador legal proceedings that could result in the impeachment of President Guillermo Lasso continue as now the parts call witnesses to declare. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov arrived in Brazil, the first destination of his Latin American tour, which runs from April 17th to the 24th and also includes Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. And in Sudan, fighting continues between the army and the Rapid Support Forces Parliamentary Group for a third consecutive day, leaving more than 185 people dead so far. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Lesu Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Ecuador, legal proceedings that could result in the impeachment of President Guillermo Lasso continue as now the parts call witnesses to declare. Among those summoned to testify are the former National Secretary of Anti-Corruption Public Policy, Luis Verde Soto, Acting Comptroller General of the State, Carlos Rio Frio, and the former manager of Petro Ecuador, Hugo Aguiar as well as the journalists of the digital media La Posta, Anderson Boscan. Last week, the impeachment petitioners brought to the legislative table 11 documentary evidence against Guillermo Lasso for alleged embezzlement in a contract between national companies. Lasso's attorney sent a letter that the auditing commission of the National Assembly requesting the practice of exonerating evidence. In Brazil, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov held a joint press conference with his counterpart Mauro Vieira on Monday. Vieira said that during the meeting they discussed, among other issues, the situation in Ukraine and possible ways to resolve the conflict in the country. Vieira also said Brazil is ready to participate in the peaceful solution of the conflict. Brazilian minister reaffirmed the country's position on the ceasefire in Ukraine, which should take place as soon as possible, and show respect for human humanitarian law and the restoration of lasting peace. Lavrov arrived on Monday in Brazil, the first destination of his Latin American tour, which runs from April 17th to the 21st, and also includes Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. The visit focuses on the potential of the brazilian russian strategic partnership and prospects for cooperation in areas of common interest, with a focus on science and technology, energy, defense, trade, and education, as well as strengthening political dialogue on bilateral, international, and regional issues. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, received the Colombian foreign minister, Álvaro Leiva Durán. According to local media, the meeting served to further accelerate the bilateral agenda. The Venezuelan head of state and the Colombian head of diplomacy reviewed the strategic cooperation agreements in order to move forward in the restoration of relations between Venezuela and Colombia. The Colombian foreign minister said that the meeting also served to prepare for the international conference on the Venezuelan political process. For his part, President Maduro thanked the minister for his availability via his social media. The Chilean government launched an intervention plan to increase police presence in 46 municipalities in the country. According to the government, the 46 municipalities are those where over half of the country's crimes are committed. The plan, called Streets Without Violence in Communities, will design a specific intervention strategy for each territory based on coordinated actions with Carabineros, the riot police, but is strongly questioned, specifically for the human rights violations committed, particularly in the most precarious areas and during the social unrest of late 2019. The feeling of insecurity among Chileans exceeds 80%. In Haiti, journalist Dumesky Gersen was killed in the early hours of Monday morning in Carrefour, located at the southern exit of the Haitian capital, by unidentified individuals. According to several media reports, Gersen, who worked for Radio Tele in Urep, was shot in the area of Mohetier, 83, at around 5 a.m. local time. Preliminary reports indicate he had witnessed a crime and the perpetrators executed him in retaliation. The reporter joins a growing list of journalists who have been killed, kidnapped, or tortured in Haiti. In 2022 alone, nine journalists were killed by armed groups or the police, while a dozen were injured. The president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, arrived in New York in the United States in the first official meeting between the two leaders and will take place at the U.S. government headquarters in Washington, D.C. 
The Colombian government indicated that Petro and Biden will discuss several issues on the bilateral agenda, such as drug policy and total peace, migration, investment opportunities, and climate change. The Colombian president will present to his U.S. counterpart the changes on the extradition treaty, as well as the fight against drugs and drug trafficking, as the Colombian head of state insisted that U.S. cooperation is needed to transform the country's current drug policy. In addition to the meeting with Joe Biden, the Colombian head of state take part in a U.N. forum on the rights of the indigenous community and meet with congressmen. The meeting between Gustavo Petro and Joe Biden responds to a formal invitation from the U.S. government. Let's take a short break, but first remember you can follow us on TikTok at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The National Cuba Solidarity Network, a U.S. coalition that currently has more than 50 organizations in favor of lifting Washington's blockade of the island, will be part of the 16th International May 1st Brigade. As announced by the coalition on Twitter each year, they work with the Cuban Institute of Friendship with the peoples to lead the U.S. delegation in that solidarity collective. According to the body's call, the group will have the opportunity to witness the historic popular parade of International Workers' Day in Havana's Revolution Square. In addition, they will attend the International Meeting of Solidarity with Cuba, visit places of historical, economic, cultural, and social interest, carry out volunteer work days, and exchange with representatives of different organizations of society, among other activities. The organization also strives to remove Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism, a status that President Joe Biden maintains and calls for an end to Washington's hostility against the Caribbean nation. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's financial filings with the Federal Election Commission have offered the public a first glimpse into his earnings in the years following his presidential term. The more than 100-page document reveals that the social media platform Truth Social, which the Republican launched in early 2022, after being banned from Twitter, has earned its owner just $201 US dollars despite being valued at between $5 million and $25 billion million on its launching cost. The report also showed that the former U.S. leader earned more than $5 million from his fishes between $100,000 and $1 million from his non-fungible token scheme and $5 million in royalties through the DT Marks, Oman, one of his offshore companies. Italy's financial police seized two tons of cocaine floating adrift in the sea of the coast of Sicily. The drugs were cautiously sealed in 1,600 smaller packages that were inside 70 floating waterproof sacks to prevent water seepage and sinking. All the packages were held together by nets and fitted with a light signaling device. According to the local AGI agency, it would be a shipment of narcotics left at sea by cargo ships, which were then to be retrieved and transported mainland. The drugs were reportedly detected by the naval air group of the Messina police. The amount of drugs seized represents a record since the cocaine was valued at at least 400 million euros. The British Parliament announced the opening of an investigation into Prime Minister Rishi Sunak for alleged conflict of interest. The investigation appears to have been prompted by his wife, Akshata Murthis, links to a shell care company called Koro Kids, which is listed on the government website as one of six agencies responsible for this. According to some media reports, the company will be a beneficiary of a government pilot scheme to incentivize people to become shell carers. Parliament questions whether Sunak's statement on the issue was open and frank in accordance with the rules set by the Standards Commissioner, as the company could benefit from a policy announced in the spring budget. Chinese troops remain on high alert as U.S. ships pass through Taiwan Strait. Xi Ji, a Chinese Navy spokesman, criticized the U.S. Navy's sensationalist approach to the issue. He warned that the troops remain on alert to defend national sovereignty, regional peace, and stability in the area. The ship passed through the Taiwan Strait yesterday. It is one of many U.S. military incursions that China sees as provocative and that always lead to heightened tensions. 
A few days ago, the People's Liberation Army surrounded Taiwan with a major air-sea maneuver, warning that it was meant to deter foreign interference and the island separatist aspirations. Regarding this issue, China's foreign ministry spokesperson said China has been clear on its position defending its sovereignty. I believe you have noticed that the spokesperson for the Eastern Theater Command of the People's Liberation Army of China has made our position clear on the relevant events. China will resolutely safeguard its sovereignty and security and safeguard peace and stability in the region. Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Galusin of Russia stressed on Monday that his country is confronted with the military industrial conglomerate of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and Ukraine, where Kiev is the springboard and the West is the headquarters, rear guard and supplier. Galusin, who spoke at the scientific practical conference Ukraine between Russia and the West, held on Monday at the House of the Russian Historical Society, added that Ukraine today is a stumbling block in relations between Moscow and the West. According to the Deputy Foreign Minister, the aim of this policy is to build a configuration of international relations that will be beneficial for it to maintain unipolarity and the former hegemony, using for this purpose any available means. Kalusin drew attention to the fact that the supply of arms by NATO member countries to Ukraine in total has already exceeded 65 billion euros. This Monday, Sweden has started the Aurora 23 military exercises. Over 25,000 people are involved in the operation, considered the most important of all times for the Scandinavian nation. The Defense Ministry has explained that this drill is aimed at strengthening the existing potential to repel a possible armed attack against the country. These exercises involve the Army, the fleet, the Air Force, and units of People's Militia. Trainings will take place in the south of the country, on Gotland Island and its surroundings. In addition to the Swedish military, there will, there will also be participants from the United States, United Kingdom, Finland, Poland, Norway and Ukraine, among others. The World Health Organization reiterated its alert on antibiotic resistance, considering this problem to be one of the greatest health threats facing humanity today. Multi-drug resistant bacteria can spread from animals to humans through the food chain. Recent studies show that bacteria potentially capable of causing serious human infections or proving to be multi-drug resistant can be found in chicken, tur turkey, pork, and beef. Experts suggest that levels of antibiotic resistant bacteria, including E. coli expec in meat products, be regularly assessed. An increasing number of infections, for example pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea, and salmonellosis, are becoming more difficult to treat because of the loss of antibiotic efficacy. WHO recalled that antibiotic resistance prolonged hospital stays, increases medical costs, and increases mortality. Telesor English continues to grow. You can now tune in from 33 different African countries through Starsat, dial 461, and enjoy a Latin American alternative broadcast. One final short break, and we'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back from the south. In Sudan, the death of Rose as fighting between the army and parliamentary forces led by rival General Rage for a third day in different Sudanese provinces. Civilian death toll from their fighting rose to more than 180, with more than 1,800 civilians and combatants injured. Moreover, the number of casualties thought to be far higher, with many wounded unable to reach hospitals due to the danger of movement during the fighting. According to the doctors' union, the fighting had heavily damaged multiple hospitals in Khartoum other cities with some rendered completely out of service. The violence has forced terrified people to shelter in their homes, fearing for a prolonged conflict that could plunge Sudan into a deeper chaos.
The United Nations Special Representative to Sudan, Volker Perthes Moore, said at a press briefing in New York on Monday that more than 180 people have been killed and about 1,800 others injured in three days of fighting between rival factions in the African country. More than 180 fatalities, people killed, more than 1,800 injured, uh, including three uh, colleagues from the World Food Programme who have been killed while trying to serve the Sudanese people in North Darfur. Secretary General of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Siyad al Nahala, assured that the Palestinian resistance and its allies surround Israel. During an interview in Iraq, al Nahala assured that the Palestinian people are in a large scale confrontation with the occupiers. He stated that Tel Aviv has noticed that the Palestinian resistance now has a great power of dissuasion and ratifies that Israel is surrounded by tens of thousands of resistant missiles from Gaza and Lebanon. Al Nahala also said that the escalation of the Palestinian resistance in the West Bank posed a direct threat to the security of the Israeli entity. The leader also referred to the reconciliation agreements between Iran and Saudi Arabia and stressed the accord sent an important message to countries in the region. Iranian justice has issued final judgment in the case of Ukrainian airliner shutdown as 10 servicemen had been convicted. After extensive investigation and over 20 hearings, the Iranian Judicial Authority that initiated the process in 2021 has convicted at the second branch of Tehran's military court 10 people for their responsibility in the airplane incident. The main defendant has been sentenced to 13 years in prison for disregarding orders from his hierarchy and shooting down the aircraft. He was the commander of the Tor M1 system who confused Ukrainian Flight 752 with a cruise missile. The others found guilty are the personnel of the Air Defense Station. On Monday, Myanmar's military announced plans to release 3,113 prisoners, including 98 foreigners, to mark the nation's traditional New Year. The army has jailed thousands of opponents and anti-government activists since it seized power in a coup last February and cracked down on protests. Human rights groups say 3,240 civilians have been killed in the crackdown. Army spokesman Lieutenant General Ong Lin Dui said the amnesty was a celebration of Myanmar's New Year for the joy of the people and to address humanitarian concerns. We have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website, telesoenglish.net. Also, join us on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.